Well, thank you very much, and uh, what, a, what a joy it is to be back. Hello. <laughs> it is uh, good, good to be here. You know, you could get up and just try to say something to be saying something. Um, uh, certainly, I love the Whitsons. I mean, I really, really do. They're just very, very good friends, and I was uh, telling some of the guys coming over, I think we go back about 40 years, so it's uh, been wonderful having them as friends, and I love them and thank God for them. I uh, started a sabbatical and went to the convention, and the night I got there, I started having some unusual pains. I was by myself or my wife. She would have made me do something about it, but I'm a little stubborn by myself, so I waited till the next day, and there was uh, a special honor I wanted to be a part of. Uh, it, it was sort of based around me, and so I held on, held on. As soon as I finished receiving that uh, honor, I got Uber and went to the hospital and spent six days. I had a ruptured appendix. And so, um, <clears throat> in fact, I'm still facing the surgery in about two weeks. But anyway, I, um, it took about 15 days to get me beyond that where I could start my exercise again. And so I was at Panama City Beach, and there's a um, conservation park there, five different trails, long, long trails, and I walk a long ways every uh, morning. And so this day, I just started to walk a long ways. And I'll just be honest, I like all kinds of music. I mean, you know, a lot of people would basically say some of us are carnal for listening to this type, and some are carnal. Matter of fact, I think if you pick on people because they don't like what you like, you're very legalistic, judgmental, and I'm going to deal with that in just a moment. But anyway, I really do. I have, I have a wide variety of uh, playlists that I like. You know, New Songs family, so... They're very godly men. If you had any idea what they gave to the kingdom of God, uh, you would be impressed with the walk of Eddie Carswell. So we're family. My daughter married his son, and so we are been in there, been chairman of that board for 30 years. Anyway, I saw that. But, but out there, I was going to go for a walk and wanted to listen to some music, so I thought I'm going to go through a playlist of the Goodmans. And uh, I walked eight miles that day. I did, just listening and, and worshiping. I mean, hardly anybody's out there. My wife's scared something's going to get me out there. There's wild hogs and all sorts of stuff. But uh, Rusty Goodman, when I first got saved, and I've been a Christian 45 years, but I'd never owned a Bible and I'd never been to church, maybe three times. Dad was an alcoholic, divorced family, raised in a project, quit school at 16, managed a pool room four years. So church was not on my playlist. And the bottom line is when I first got saved and they, he called the other day and my associates here and arranged this, I'm going to do this major event for Jack Price. And the reason is, is the first music I ever heard as a new believer was Jack Price and it was singing, Who Am I That a King Would Bleed and Die For? Uh, some golden daybreak, Jesus will come. And so I've always loved that music. So the memories of that music, I loved, loved, loved Rusty Goodman. And he did, he died way too Young. So I just wanted to throw that in for what it's worth. Um, just FYI, after you buy all their music, because you ought to, I wrote a book last year, became a number one seller across the country, Demolishing Strongholds. The new one I wrote this year is Unspoken, What Men Won't Talk About Why. Writing a new book right now called Anchored. But anyway, I just mentioned it um, for what it's worth. We're homeless right now. I, my wife said to me one day, I want you to build me one more new house. And I thought, you really do? And we had just totally remodeled ours. I mean, I, I will never understand the opposite sex. And, um, but, you know, when you've been doing what you do for 45 years, and when you said, I don't regret one mile I've traveled, uh, literally, I promise you, and, and I'm saying it, but I, I literally travel uh, uh, every week, uh, just literally all over the world, I mean, from which is in Vietnam teaching, and then I truck crossed back over and I trained Iranians in Turkey, and I mean, just all, all over the world and all over the nation uh, preaching. And um, she's followed me, so I thought, good Lord, at this juncture in our life, God's been good to us, been faithful stewards. She wants a new house, get you a new house. So, um, so we're going to build a new house, and then she changed her mind, and that's a woman's prerogative. She said, I don't want to build one, so she bought one that afternoon. But we still don't have it yet. It's, we'll move in it in about 30 days. Uh, Y'all understand over there. So, uh, so we don't have any furnishings because we sold everything that we furnished the house with to the people that bought our other house. Anyway, uh, where I'm going with this is when I did have a house, I would put in my four-digit code 
and put stay and it sets the alarm. And so the windows and the doors, uh, if they're breached, it, it'll wake up the whole neighborhood. <laughs> but there's something, Janet use it, but I never would. You can put in your digit and put away and it, and it actually throws these red sensors across your floor and it, it actually has uh, more sensitivity uh, to a breach or if anybody's in the house when you leave. Um, when God made you, he placed within the human soul a divine alarm system called the conscience. And God recently gave me a sermon on the conscience. Uh, Noah Webster said the conscience is the capacity, listen to this, to know right from wrong with a compulsion to do right. Not, not only does God give you the capacity to know right from wrong, he actually nudges you. I, I'm telling you, it is hard to go to hell. He, he's pressing you to go in the right direction. And I'll show you that's why we'll be without excuse. One of the reasons you're without excuse when you go to hell is because of the conscience. Creation of conscience and the word of God has been placed in the human heart. The Bible says God, John 1, 9, has given light to every man who's come into the world. Nobody's ever been born that God didn't give them light to know that there is a God above. Uh, Webster is one thing, but open a Greek New Testament and take the word conscious and define it. It is a compound Greek word, and it uses the preposition with to know. Uh, so God has given us a co-knowledge with ourselves. Have you ever wondered in the Lord's Supper, in 1 Corinthians 11, that Paul would say to the church, judge yourself that you may not be judged of God. How do you judge yourself? Your conscience. Uh, God's given you this divine alarm system. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2, verse 15, that the conscience does one of two things. It accuses you or excuses you. Mine works. I have an awesome conscience. Uh, when I leave home and I've said a harsh word to my wife, I'm not a mile down the road. The alarm goes off and says, you didn't, you didn't speak right to your wife. And it's just not right. And what you'll do, if you're not careful, you'll get witnesses against the Holy Spirit. You'll go to your office and share with your associate uh, what happened to tick you off. And, and then they say, yeah, my wife does that sometimes. They agree with you. And remember, they're on your payroll. <laughs> and you can get two or three people. But no wonder the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. And so until I repent and ask her to forgive me, my conscience doesn't excuse me. And so God's given us a conscience. And so... I'm going to say some things, five statements, and try to say it, you know, sort of right to the point. And it'd be hard probably just to memorize, but if you've got a pencil, pen, lipstick, or mascara, I'd encourage you to <laughs> jot down uh, these statements. The conscience uh, is designed to serve as a goad and a governor, not a guide. Uh, there's sayings that we buy into that are unbiblical. Just let your conscience be your guide. No, let your conscience enlightened by the word of God be your guide. It's the light that's instilled by the Holy Spirit in the word of God that becomes your guide. But it's a goad. When Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was on the road to Damascus in Syria in Acts chapter 9, the Bible says that Jesus spoke from heaven and said, why do you kick against the goads? And the word that is used there is the, the word really for a farmer that has this long wooden handle with a metal tip on the end. He was used with an ox and it would prick him, it would goad him. And th that's what God does in our life when you're hearing the proclamation of God's word under the anointing of the spirit of God. A uh, lady's doing Bible study in her home and she said to these ladies, I'd like for you to come to our church and they said, we're not coming. I said, why not? I said, we've already been. We don't like to hear Pastor Hunt. I said, why not? I said, we leave there sometimes and we just don't feel good about ourselves. And said, well, where do you go? And they told them where they went and that'll remain unnamed. And they said, we go there and said, every time we go there, we feel good. There's only one thing wrong. You're not that good. 
And I'm telling you, in Jesus' name, none of us are so good that every week we can go and we feel good. And so we, we get goaded. Uh, it serves as a governor. I, I like to remind people there's so much being said today about how um, that certainly God is sovereign in salvation. I believe that. Of course I believe that. But God is also sovereign in sanctification. I, I really do. I believe that the governor of the Spirit of God is a restraining influence in my life that holds me back from doing things that if he were not there, I would do. I thought before, I almost made a crazy decision. I have a city of refuge for hurting pastors. The saddest thing in the world brought a couple in or came to see me yesterday, be entering our ministry. And they're so young. They're so, such a handsome guy, such a beautiful girl. They've got a two, three, and a four-year-old. And there's been major moral failure in their life. So we have a ministry. And have 23 years, we'll bring them in. I think we've got four or five there now. Uh, good men, good, good women that have made some poor choices. And the reason we started that ministry is simply because uh, a good pastor spends a good bit of his time helping his people with their bad choices. And the question is, who helps the pastor with his bad choice? And so we have that uh, ministry for them. But people will say to me, did, you know, so-and-so's in your city of refuge. I said, I, I do. They say, did you hear what they did? And I said, well, I did hear what they did. And they said, can you believe it? Uh, yeah, I, I can believe it. And the reason I can believe it, I may not have done it, but I've probably thought it. But matter of fact, I want to remind you of what the Lord Jesus Christ said. In Matthew 15, 18, he said that we have adulteries and fornication and lying and stealing. And he said, and where do these come from? They proceed from your heart. And, and so I need Jesus in sanctification to overcome me. And he does that with the governor that he's placed, even on my conscience to know right from wrong. Now, I'm gonna give you a statement and it'll serve sort of as a, um, a, an understanding of everything I'm gonna say. It's the clearest statement, I think, in the message. So listen to this. The conscience may be compared to a window that lets in the light. God's law is the light and the cleaner the window is, the more the light shines in. Did you know, I, I love being a pastor. I've been a pastor 42 years. I've had many opportunities to do a lot of things other than pastor, but I absolutely love pastoring. But pastors get bum raps. Uh, consistently, someone will say like this to me. You know, pastor, last Sunday after church, we went to Longhorns and we went in and we were eating. We looked across the hall and we saw a couple and we thought, they're members at Woodstock. I don't think we've seen them in a long time. So they go over and they see them and kind of get reacquainted and say, we've been missing you. And they say, oh God, we haven't been to Woodstock in six months probably. Where are you now? Well, we're visiting around and I can define that for you. <laughs> and then they will say this, you know, um, we went there for a couple years, but you know, brother Johnny just don't minister us anymore. Uh, Greek word, hogwash. I'm, and I'm just going to tell you under God. And, and by the way, I want to promise you in Jesus' name, that does not intimidate me. To the contrary, I think it tells me more about them than about me. Because if I'm being faithful to preach the word, keeping my sin confessed up, asking God to fill me with the spirit of God, I think I'm a better preacher than I was 30 years ago or I hope even 10 years ago. Or I really think I'm better than I was last year. But... Uh, <laughs> And so could it be that it's not that I'm not communicating with gospel with power, but could it be the window of their soul has become so corrupted and so dirty by their unwillingness to listen to the probing of their conscience by the Spirit of God that the light of God's Word doesn't get in? Yeah, that may be it. But wouldn't that be cool to say, why haven't you been coming? Well, my soul's been dirty and the light hadn't. That would be awesome, wouldn't it, if somebody <laughs> would tell the truth. So the conscience is not an infallible guide and it acts only according to the light that it has. Let me give you a verse and just trying to introduce this. Romans 9, 1, I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. So the conscience of God coincides with the spirit 
of God in man. And when the spirit controls the conscience, it can be trusted, but it remains imperfect and its warnings must always be evaluated by the word of God. So the conscience is a, a God implanted knowledge of what's right and wrong in our hearts. So here it is, number one. Let me talk first of all about a good conscience. Acts 24, 16, the Bible says, and this being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and man. And, and by the way, we live in a day, and uh, Baptists may not mean this, but we say it too much. Well, I don't care what they think. Just, I just care what God thinks. Well, if you read your Bible careful, uh, you ought to watch the way you walk among those outside. It's one of the prerequisites to being a pastor that really honors God. And so uh, I, I want to be able to be an influence in the community that I live in. I want a conscience that's without offense toward God and man. Another, Acts 23, 1, then Paul looking earnestly at the council said, men and brethren, I have lived, listen to the language, in all good conscience before God until this day. I was talking to one of the young men I'm mentoring on the way over here and I said, think about this. For Paul to say, that he has a good conscience before God, this is awesome. It means that God in his grace had acquitted his guilt. How could I stand and preach the gospel with power knowing some of the things that I did in the past? How could Paul stand and preach the gospel to people that he had persecuted? Many of them that were listening to him preach realized he consented to the death of the first New Testament martyr, but God had acquitted him. And so how can we stand up I mean, we're not perfect individuals. Uh, but, and I know all about the righteousness of Christ, but I thank God that God acquits us of our past. Now, Paul was standing when he gave those verses and there's others. He, he was in Caesarea by the sea. I've been to Israel many times. Pastor and I were talking about Israel tonight. And uh, without exception, you fly into Tel Aviv. We always spend the night on the Mediterranean. And then our first stop, without exception, is always Caesarea by the sea. And at Caesarea by the sea, we go into the arena. I normally give my testimony because Paul gave his testimony there before Felix, Festus, and Agrippa. And it was there that he stood, and they were on the judgment seat. Agrippa, the Bible says, was on the bema, on the judgment seat. And he stood there, and yet... Paul was as bold as he could be. He spoke of his confidence. Uh, he talked about love from a pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere faith. And he was able to stand bold because the Bible says that the righteous are as bold as a lion, but the wicked will flee when no one is even pursuing them. And so he stood boldly and spoke to them. He knew that God had created him with a conscience. Now, it's a good conscience, but I want you to listen to this warning. And, and in light of the ministries that God has allowed me to be a part of, this really speaks to me. In 1 Timothy 1.19, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. Shipwreck. When a person no longer listens to the probing of the Spirit of God, they can suffer shipwreck. This happens more, more times uh, than not. And I want you to know, for what it's worth, hear my heart. I'm going to illustrate very uh, modernly in the context of our culture, but I'm very tender. I've preached much in this area, and I've always tried to do it with, with, with so much compassion to even watch my demeanor, my voice inflections and everything. But I uh, uh, did a website a couple years ago, and, and the question on the website is, what would you like me to address? And literally, I promise you, thousands from all over the world came to that site and started listening. And number one thing was uh, same-sex marriage and homosexuality. Would you address that? And I addressed it. I entitled it Questions Answered. A lady will come to me and say, I want you to help me. My daughter was in the student choir here. Uh, she even gave a good bit of time on uh, Global Year and did missions out of our church. She brought friends to church that came to know Jesus. Yes. You know, you haven't seen her lately. She went off to school and uh, we noticed that she seemed to be putting quite a bit of distance between her and the Lord and said, and uh, pastor, we don't know what to do, but she's informed us this week that she's going to marry the girl that's her roommate. So I want to ask her question. How does someone get from here all the way over there? 
I really believe with all my heart, it's the conscience. So if, if you'll, oh yeah, <laughs> that, that's good. I'm excited about that. But if, um, if you'll listen to this, you'll see how it makes sense and it brings this together. And so they have rejected their conscience and their faith. They begin to say now, I used to believe like you did. I know my parents feel this way. And, and there's a whole lot of other things that are happening sometimes in the context of a university. And as a result, uh, they begin to just think that we're old fashioned, that we're archaic. And, and by the way, I've felt like a dinosaur since I was 25 years old and preaching in our denomination. And so a good conscience serves as a rudder and it steers the believer through the rocks and reefs of sin. Uh, someone said the other day, said, if you want to go to distance as a preacher, just stay balanced in the word of God. Just don't get weird over here in some crazy doctrine and, and don't just focus yourself like a cult in just one particular area. Second Timothy 1, 3, Paul said, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. Number two, stay with me, a good conscience. But a good conscience, you've got to be careful or you'll suffer shipwreck. But number two, a weak conscience. 1 Corinthians 8, 12, but when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Now, there's a call in Scripture to be sensitive to your conscience, wait a minute, but also to the conscience of others. We're living in a generation of meism, of self centeredness. If I understand my Bible right, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 and following, I'm to love the Lord thy God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then I'm to love my neighbor as myself. So I really like to think of it, I'm to love him and them. And so it's really about others. Uh, William Booth, if there was one word about William Booth's life, it was the word others. I've told my wife, I said, if I die before you and God keeps my testimony intact and I continue to try to serve and minister to others, I pray that if there's just one word you can put as an epitaph on my tombstone, I pray that it will be the word others. But instead we're living for ourselves. I hear everyone talking about I've got liberty, I can do this. You're just legalistic. You, you were raised. People that know I came out of an alcoholic background and, and they just say, Pastor Johnny, your problem is it's really drinking that's in moderation. Uh, I, I didn't plan to say this. So whoever it is, for, I don't know why in the world is even coming to my mind. I wish I didn't have ADD. I wouldn't have to deal with all these thoughts <laughs> that come. I feel like my mind's a transistor radio. Uh, last week in Wilmington, North Carolina, that's my hometown. I was born in Lumberton, Native American, raised in Wilmington. While I was there, a pastor came to see me and said, my son's serving, and I could name the church. I know the church. I know the founding pastor of that church who started and everything. His son went there, a student pastor, good boy, teetotaler. But the pastor and the rest of them drank and said, moderation's okay when we go out. Well, the long story short, this old boy got addicted. So the student pastor was arrested for a DUI, and the pastor fired him. There were two of those in the last week uh, where they got there, but they said, people call me. I wrote a sermon. It's the number two request of sermon I've ever preached in 42 years. It's entitled, A Biblical Commitment of Total Abstinence Should a Christian Drink? And then I just wrote another one two years ago because on that website, that was the number three request, would you tell us what the Bible says about alcohol? And we're living in a generation that's so quiet in that area of their life. And yet it's ruined. So it's the number one abused drug in the world. So guys will call me and a fellow will say, well, hey, I listened to your tape and you're hurting a lot of people with that, putting people under guilt. And they, they could know the joy and the celebration of alcohol and do it in moderation. Adrian Rogers said, and he's in heaven, I love to quote him because he was my mentor and he's in heaven. So though he's dead, yet he speaketh, he speaks through other people. Bottom line is, Adrian Rogers said that moderation is not the cure for alcoholism, it's the cause. I've never known anybody to become a drunk and never took their first drink. And it's addictive. Uh, I've got friends that were alcoholic. I've got one of my best friends has been in five institutions and God delivered him. I believe if I served him a thimble of wine at church, he'd be back in another institution. I don't know what I said. So a psychologist called me here a while back and wanted to debate me. He's from South Carolina. Just really wanted to debate me. I think he wanted to tell everybody he had taken me on alcohol. 
So I just asked him this question. What am I doing preaching this? I've got to hurry and get back to the sermon. So, so here's what he said. He said, I think uh, there's nothing wrong as long as it's in moderation. I said, so you drink? And I said, yeah. And I said, have you ever had too much? He said, well, everybody has. I mean, if you're going to drink, everybody's going to have too much sometime or another. I said, what do you call that? And he would, he would never say the word. It's drunkenness because then it's sin. So we just say just drunkenness is sin. Well, I'll tell you what I told my children. I raised two girls, my wife did, and she just let me hang out with them. But the bottom line is, I mean, really, I, I told my girls, honest to God, I remember telling Deanne and Holly, and I, I really took it on. I taught my girls virginity, dated them individually, took it out of me, got a whole lesson on how I taught them about their virginity. Oh, that was scary. But I remember um, saying to them uh, when you're on it, I was preparing them. Preventive truth. I said, don't ever get in the back seat with a guy. And um, it was just laid it out here. So what would you do? Just say, I remember when I told him, I said, uh, just picture a gift with me. And I said, this gift is something God's given you. It's your virginity. And it's all wrapped up beautifully. And you're to not allow it to be unpackaged until the night of your wedding. And I said, see the bow on the package? I said, yeah. I said, no petting. Don't let them touch the ribbon. But, but, it's a, but, 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 but so where does it lead? You, and by the way, unless you get that truth in them, your hormones will outrun your heart every time. And the same thing with the alcohol. So, just, so we're concerned about it. So, so what was the problem? He's sitting there and, he's, and he's, he's causing these weaker believers to stumble. And I'm to concern myself with others. In Corinth, Paul went there for 18 months. When he got there, it's a pagan city. They had temple worship there, but it was uh, idolatrous temple worship they had temple prostitutes down at the church house so y'all you with me and um, what they would do they would offer meat as a sacrifice to their gods and you could buy that meat at a reduced rate study that in history but those old boys some of those roughnecks started getting saved and here's what they said I'll tell you since uh, I've crowned Jesus king of my life I don't want to go down to those idol worship grocery stores anymore but some of the older believers were still going there to buy it because it was cheap. And they were probably like Judas saying they were giving the extra money to the church. <laughs> you remember Judas said, uh, what we need to do is, is we need to, instead of spending and watching money be wasted on somebody uh, washing Jesus' feet with this perfume, we could have sold it and give it to the poor. And then Jesus said he was stealing from the treasury. There wouldn't have been any money there to help the poor. He was stealing from the treasury. So, but anyway, so it went on there. So the question is, well, what did Paul think? So listen to the next verse, 1 Corinthians 8, 13. This is the word of God. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I'll never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. I tell you, I believe there's some things God may call us to give up to cause others to stumble. That's a whole lot easier to give up than meat. But here, here's a man says, if there's something going on and it's causing people to stumble, and I'm telling you, a bunch of people are stumbling um, in this area of alcohol. Number, number three, a convicting conscience. We've won five of them, so let's move. A convicting conscience. John 8, 9. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning at the oldest, even to the least. And by the way, that's where conviction ought to start in those of us that know him best. The oldest down to the least. And then the Bible says, and Jesus was left alone and a woman standing in the midst. You know the story, right? The woman is taking the very act of adultery. I studied it again early this morning. On numerous occasions in the Gospels, the, the, the Pharisees would, would try to kind of catch Jesus. They, would, they said, Let, let's get him. Like, uh, hey, master, we know that the law says this, but rabbi, what do you say? So that's what they did. They said, we caught this woman in adultery. We don't know what the Bible says about this woman caught in adultery. They got rocks in their hands. And they said, but what do you say? Well, first of all, and this is just a good word, Jesus doesn't have to answer you. <laughs> People are always telling me. I bet almost once a month somebody comes to me and says, I'll tell you, when I get to heaven, I, I got a question for God. Who, who do you think you are? You forgot you are the clay. He is the potter. And he don't have to answer you. I, I've got a sanctified imagination. I can picture one day when we get to heaven on the throne is none other than Jesus Christ, and he will be arrayed with Calvary's marks all through eternity. And we'll know within a shadow of a doubt why we're there is all because of what he did. 
Mary John Wilkins, the first person I ever heard sing it, the only thing there that's been made by man are the scars in the hands of Jesus. So we're, we're there worshiping him and praising him. And then there's a long line, mostly Baptists, over here on the right. And the question is, who are they? Well, they've, they've got a question for God. So they'll, they'll be back and worship his son later. But right now, uh, they're questioning. And by the way, if this woman was called in the act of adultery, am I the only one that wants to ask the question, where's the man? Uh, so they said, so what do you think, master? He, he didn't answer them. Instead, he knelt down and he began to write in the sand. Uh, nobody knows, really. We can speculate. But nobody literally knows what he wrote. Someone may say, well, I think he wrote the Ten Commandments. Well, I would go a step further and say, I think it'd be more personal. He certainly knows us by name. And he knows everything about us. Uh, everything that's ever been done in darkness is going to be brought to light. So he could have just taken the oldest dude there and just written one thing about him. And maybe put a comma like, we can finish this. But anyway, whatever he wrote, they dropped their rocks, beginning with the oldest to the least. And then he said, lady, where are your accusers? Lord, I see none. Neither do I condemn you. And literally, here's the translation. Go and stop your sinning. Um, isn't that amazing? He that's without sin, let him cast a first stone. There was only one there that could have thrown a rock. And I, I got to thinking about it. I, I, I was sitting in my office. When I had this thought, I, uh, I really got happy. Jesus could have picked up Mount Hermon in one hand and Mount Nebo in the other. And woof uh, on them. I mean, he could, he could have if he wanted to. If, let he that's without sin cast the first stone. And so here's a woman uh, caught in adultery and they're demanding justice according to the law. I don't know about you, but I love James chapter two, verse 14, where my Bible says that mercy triumphs over judgment. I need the mercy of God. So the conscience is the soul's warning system which allows human beings to contemplate their motives and actions and make moral evaluation what's right and wrong. We were talking about Spurgeon coming up the road with a sermon series I'm doing. These guys were helping me in, in my series. And Spurgeon said when he saw a man on death row, but by the grace of God, there go I. And, uh, and then if you read your Bible in Romans chapter, in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, it says that we which are spiritual, first of all, to consider ourselves when we see others that have made poor choices and that in meekness and humility, uh, we ought to help them lest we find ourselves in the same predicament. And so it's a, a warning to us. Uh, so God has written his law on our heart. And we know the basic standard of right and wrong. And so when we violate that standard, his conscience produces guilt, which acts as a mind's security system that produces fear and guilt and shame and doubt as warnings or threats to the soul's well-being. And yet on the other hand, when the believer does God's will, he enjoys the Father's affirmation, assurance and peace and joy of a good conscience. Number four. A defiled conscience. Titus 1.15. Isn't it amazing? There's a good conscience. There's a weak conscience. There's a convicting conscience. And there's a defiled conscience. The Bible says to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Even their mind and conscience are defiled. The word for defiled there is our word corruption. It's the corruption of the conscience. So it's possible to sin against the probing of the conscience until it becomes defiled. Uh, I love to be able to take a word study and see everywhere the word corruption is used in the New Testament and how it's translated. One of my favorite with this word is in Hebrews 12, 15, and it's referring to bitterness, and it actually translates the word die, D-Y-E. Defiled, died, corruption. Uh, I was on a plane and uh, I hardly ever have a shirt with a pocket anymore, but I had a white shirt and I was going to a speaking engagement and it's the only shirt I had with me and I had my pen in there and I, uh, I mentioned the jeweler a moment ago 
this jeweler in my church is a wholesaler to wholesalers and he di- deals in the real high-end watches and rings and jewelry and he also has pens and he's always given me a really nice pen and I call God as my witness and he, and he hasn't in a long time. I begged him not to give me any more pens. And, and the reason, are, reason is I, I lose them or when I'm signing books at the church, my members take them. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Maybe. Uh, but, uh, so what I carry is, this is a uniball. Is this what I write sermons with? Is right, or, I just like, I, I keep, the only bad thing about this, sometimes when you're on a flight, um, the high altitude and the pressure in the cabin will cause them to burst. So the flight attendant's coming down, serving, and she looks, she says, oh no. And sure enough, I look down and my, the, there was a big black spot, wet on my shirt. And I took my pen out and it's just soaked in ink and she threw it away and she said, you're in luck. Did you know that seltzer water, club soda, will take that ink out? I said, awesome. She went and got a club soda, brought back a little cloth, and I took it. And sure enough, I started wiping, and it started coming out. And the more I rubbed, when I finished, this whole side of my shirt was gray. <laughs> it, it, uh, My wife cuts up with me, and this is it's really just funny, but uh, I, I have mentored so many preachers and tried to help speak into the life of so many preachers, literally by the thousands, over the last 25 years, that uh, in my earlier days in particular, uh, whatever I wore, they would wear. If I bought shoes, they'd get them. In fact, I was preaching one day, and I went like that and caught to my jacket, and it tore it, and my wife said, get it sewed. Every one of those young preachers would tear their coats. I mean, it was just, it, it was crazy. And uh, she thought that day, you know, you got to get rid of that shirt. All of them would do this. So uh, it was di- died. Um, did you know you can't control sin? Wait, wait a minute. Did you know you can't manage sin? I'm not uh, a counselor. Uh, I have great education, and I certainly have prepared myself, but I have a full counseling ministry. But anybody can see me, so I, I don't know anyone can come and see me. And I'll see them once, and then I recommend them someone that's far more qualified. But I try to speak into their life. So a lady came to see me the other day, and this fits right in. And one other point, I'm through. Here it is. She said, I need you to help me. I said, well, I, I, I hope I can. And we prayed together, and here's what she said. I deeply love my husband, but he doesn't think I love him, and he's talking about leaving. And so, I, and I, I believe God can help us. So I said, uh, "Ma'am, do you hate anybody?" And she said, "What kind of question is that?" I told you I love my husband, and I know I love him, but he says he doesn't feel I love him. I said, "Back, back to the question. Do you hate anybody?" And she teared up and she said, I, I, I hope he goes to hell. I hope my daddy goes to hell and I hope when he gets to hell, I hope they turn it up and I hope his brother goes to hell too. They both deserve to be in hell and I hate both of them. And then she started, kept on and she said, uh, my daddy abused me and he let his brother abuse me and he ought to be in hell. Uh, wait a minute, I said that you can't control sin. Do you know you can't compartmentalize your life? You think you can. So what this lady did, she had this little place over here where she deeply hated. She had died that part of her soul. And it had, listen to me, it tainted her. So even her love could not be pure because it had been died by her hatred. So her husband couldn't feel the force of love because it was tainted and corrupted in her conscience and in her soul. And you can't do it. That's why when a person gets into pornography, he can't love his wife like he ought to because he's tainted his soul with some imaginary pictures of somebody else. So even though he tries to love his wife like he ought to, it's tainted by his pornography and by his lust and it's, it's grayed his heart. And until God cleans that heart up, we'll never be the person we ought to be. So I want to be clean in those areas because of my darling wife. I really do, and because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, let me give you one last, and I'm done. We're talking about our conscience. There's a good conscience, but we need to be aware of the weak consciences and how we can sin against the brothers. You know, not only do we sin against God, we, we, the Bible says you sin against your brothers. 
And, and then we're convicted. Our conscience is convicted. God will convict our conscience. He will prick us. Uh, the word convict means to expose. God will expose our need. People hear a sermon and say, well, I'll get a copy of that. I'll tell you, so-and-so needed to hear that. Well, if you're not careful, you're always thinking of someone else instead of letting God expose your own need from the word of God. And, and so then he brings them to a defiled, a corrupted, but then listen to this one, and I'll close with this one. Number five, but a seared conscience. In 1 Timothy 4, 2, and this is, this is where we really get off track. The Bible says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. The word seared is a medical term referring to cauterization. It's the allowing of your conscience to become desensitized. Now, remember I told you a moment ago I love to do word studies? Where, where is my favorite translation of the word seared? Ephesians 4.19. The Bible is warning. These people have put off the old man. They put on the new man in Christ. But then Paul warns them how they can go back into bad places based on their choices and their actions. And he says this, that you can become past feeling. Past feeling. Uh, things used to move you. A preacher's got to be careful that uh, I've been standing behind the sacred desk. I did four service a day for 17 years. Now I just do three in the morning. So the bottom line is, uh, you could begin to think, just take this for granted. I mean, you know, I, I, I know how to do this. I teach preaching for heaven's sakes. And so you, you just get where you can just do it. And the truth is your heart's just not in it. You no longer sense the need for Jesus to come in power where God can change people for the glory of God. And you become desensitized. You're past feeling. You're going through the motions. You've been there, you've done that. And listen to music, it never touches you. It never moves you. I, 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 um, I, I'm a good friend with Toby Mac. I love Toby Mac. Somebody says, that's too wild for me. Well, it just depends on whether you like a beat or you like lyrics. I'm into what it says. And what it says is, I don't want to gain the whole world and lose my soul. And so I think about it. And by the way, you need to study your text carefully. That's not just talking about going to hell. You can lose the purpose for living, which is in essence losing the life that God had intended for you and in essence lose your soul in this life. He's got a brand new song. Look the lyrics up. I just need you. I just need you. And at the end of the day, my greatest need is I just need Jesus. Need him to come. So, so what it's referring to, stay with me. I'm about to wrap it up. Morally insensitive. So as you continue to sin, here it is. As you continue to sin, turn away from God, you become still more apathetic about moral and spiritual things. It speaks of losing of moral restraint. See, the Christian hope and strength is in the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit. So repeated sinning hardens the conscience so that it becomes seared like scar tissue. And the neglected and resisted conscience becomes more insensitive and may eventually stop giving warning systems about wrongdoing. No wonder the girl says, I'm going to marry my girlfriend and I don't think anything's wrong with it anymore. She is so sinned against the probing of her conscience as God has spoken through the word. No wonder they want to move their membership. <laughs> I, uh, when I first got saved, I, I got saved on a Sunday night, snowy Sunday night, Wilmington, North Carolina. So I, I didn't own a Bible. So my wife went the next morning, never forget it, I still got a copy of it, and I closed with this. She bought me a new Bible, and I started getting up reading the Bible, and I just want you to know to this day, I give a good bit of my morning to reading the Word. I'm doing the uh, Chronological Study Bible this year. I'm about in page 900, I've opened Jeremiah, chapter 31 tomorrow morning. I read about four chapters of it. I just love the Word of God. Nothing to do with my sermon prep, my personal devotion life. I, Somebody says, oh, yeah, you're just bragging. The minute you tell us how early you get up. Well, let me tell you what I've done. I've got to thinking lately. Preachers are going to help their people. They better talk about devotion life and be able, be able to explain it to them. But what I want our people to realize is the reason I get up early every morning and spend the first hour minimum, and on Sunday, the first two hours of getting my own heart right with God, um, 
You've got to be right with God if you're going to pastor a church. Uh, so when I, when I, the other day I'm walking to the prayer room. I call God as my witness. Walk into the prayer room at the church and the man said, there you are. I need to pick a bone with you. I called the Holy Spirit of God as my witness. I said, I don't pick bones before church. See you afterwards. Went on in the room. <laughs> Somebody says, you couldn't do that at my church. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. And by the way, he didn't come after us. As a matter of fact, he hadn't come since. That was the devil just trying to mess me up. I'm not going to let that man have an audience with me and get me in the flesh and fired up when I'm getting ready to preach to thousands of people the good news and the folks that are going to watch all over the world. Absolutely not. I'm not going to do it. But you know how I do that? I pray through that morning. I spend my time. I walk the halls in my mind. Everything I'm going to do. I walk slow so I can speak to everybody. I'm friendly. But if somebody picks at me, I keep smoking. Down, down the, the road. But what I want you to hear you say is the reason I give time every day is not because I'm trying to show you how spiritual I am. Y'all missed it. I'm trying to show you how desperate I am. Yeah, Ron's always saying, well, let's finish well together. I do. I want to finish well. And I've just, I got a confession to make. It don't get easier. I'm 66 years old. It don't get easier. It really doesn't. Uh, Junior Hill, I was talking to him just the other day when I met Junior Hill in my 30s. We had breakfast together at the Holiday Inn down in Jonesboro, Georgia. He looked across the table and said, how old are you? And it was just close. I said, 35. And here's what he said. Devil don't mind waiting for you. I thought, do what? He said, the enemy, God's starting to use you. He, he, the devil would like for you to get some notoriety and get known real well. He, he'll wait on you. Then bring you down, make a whole lot bigger fall, mess up a whole lot more people. I asked Junior not long ago, I said, do you remember saying that? He said, son, I'll never forget it. And if you ever mess up, I'll kill you. <laughs> so I started reading. Here it is. I read Matthew, and I like Matthew, love Mark. But this is strange. My favorite gospel account is Luke. And you may just say why, and I'll just tell you briefly. I... Um, I love the stories. It tells where Jesus ate, who he ate with. It always tell, tells you how he hung out with sinners, what he said to sinners, and what he said to religious leaders and all. So I love Luke. And when I got in Luke, uh, what really captured my heart is Luke chapter 1, verse 15, it introduces John the Baptist. And that kind of captured my heart, and I don't know why. Maybe it's because I'm John. I'm a Baptist. But I mean, I, I, I like the story. Listen to what it said about John the Baptist. First thing I ever learned about John the Baptist. I've written many lessons on John. The Bible says John was strong in the sight of the Lord and drank neither wine nor strong drink. That's a Nazarene vow, but I'd come out of the pool room, out of drunkenness. Dad was an alcoholic, divorced mom at seven, very abusive. And I just thought, no, stay with me, I want you to hear this. I made my mind up early in my journey. I didn't want to be mediocre. I wanted to be strong. I know some men, they were real hell raisers. I mean, some when they were out there in the world, they ran with the best of them. They were loud and boisterous and mean as a snake. And they got saved and they became wooden Indians. I mean, I think, where's the energy? Matter of fact, did you know you, don't, you do not change from being a slave when you get saved? You just change masters. I was a slave of sin today. I'm a slave of righteousness. So just as much as I gave due diligence to the master called sin, I ought to be aflamed with... So anyway, so I want to be strong in the, in the sight of the Lord. So everything I'm going to tell you comes from Luke, mostly chapter 1, or Mark 6, John the Baptist. Guess who loved to hear John the Baptist preach? Herod the king. Can you imagine he's out in the Judean wilderness? Somebody says, what is that, that, that dust? Look. A storm, and it's the chariots of Herod and his entourage. And he would sit there and hear this preacher of repentance and the kingdom of God preach. Listen to what the Bible says, and nobody gives explanation because we don't know what it means. It says, and Herod, after hearing John preach, would do many things. But then, not long after that, John shows up at the palace, and here's what he says to Herod. Herodias is not your wife. She belongs to your brother Philip. You ought to give her back. He throws him in jail. Right. Would you agree with me? There must have been some type of stirring in his conscience for him to take his entourage and to drive out into the wilderness in the heat and the sand to hear a preacher preach the gospel. 
but now he throws him in prison. Here's how I think. When John was thrown in prison, he probably thought, I won't be here long because they don't know who my cousin is. <laughs> and if you're new in the faith, he's Jesus' cousin. Days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months. He's still there. They throw a party, and you need to hear what happened. Herodias left the room. The detail of the Bible is remarkable. And Herodias' daughter, they referred to as a damsel, danced for the king and for the others. And he was tanked up on embalming fluid, and so after watching her dance, he says, he, he makes this statement, a boast. I love the way you dance. Ask of me, and I will give you up to half of the kingdom. Or I'll tell you what I do when I'm writing a sermon. I read that and I put my pen down and I reflect. And here's what I thought. Had I been that little girl, I would have said, I would, like the Jude, the, I would like the Galilean basin. I want the Sea of Galilee, the Golan Heights. I like the mountains. I mean, up to half of the kingdom. But the Bible says that it was too much for her. She ran out to another room to find her mama. And when she found Herodias, her mother, she said, Mama, the king just said, he, he would give me up to half the kingdom. Mom, what do you want me to request? And she just simply said, ask for the head of John the Baptist on a silver charger. Now, how did Herod respond? The Bible says that Herod was deeply sorrowful. See, there's some things we say, and by the way, I learned this 40 years ago. A, a leader taught me this. It takes a good man to change his mind. If you make a decision and God shows you it's the wrong one, change your mind. I told him I'm going, but God showed me. The Bible says man makes plans in his heart, but the Lord directs his step. Make your plans, but leave room for divine intervention. Proverbs 16, 1, 9, and 33. God said it three times in the same chapter and used different language. And so bottom line is, he said he was sorrowful. Listen to the language. This is peer pressure for men in particular. But knowing the others that heard him, he acquiesced. He capitulated. And he had his head removed. I heard Jerry Vines do it this way. He said when Herod first heard him, here it is. Beep. 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 the death of a conscience. God's probing. God is speaking because God loves you. I love Jay Strack says it this way. God loves you like you are. But he loves you too much to leave you like you are. So when he's speaking to you and speaking into your conscience, dealing with you, probing, and he's doing that because he's accusing you. But the reason he's accusing you is not to make you feel guilty even though you do. It's to get you to the point that you'll repent and confess so he can, he can excuse you. And that's what grace does. It's what God's mercy does. So what's going on in your conscience? You don't care about how you live in front of others? Uh, you're supposed to be a model. We're supposed to be Christ-like. Uh, we're supposed to be light and salt and influencing others' lives. Uh, every person's life that connects with other people influences who are you influencing? Uh, our kids, when they're small, they follow our advice. They get older, they follow our example. Uh, we're one of the top givers in our church, and my son-in-law is number five. We have a lot of people for us to be at the top of giving in our church. And I told my son-in-law one time, I said, son, where, where did you learn to give so graciously? And so I'd date your daughter, and we'd see your Bible, and sometimes we'd pick your Bible up, and your envelope would be inside. We couldn't believe you were giving that much of your money away. And God used to convict us. I just share that to say, you can influence other people. You're an example. Unless you don't care what other people think. So, did, did you know that 60% of the money that comes in our church comes in online? I'll never give online. I hold an envelope in my hand every single week with gifts in it. I want everybody there to know it's important. I support the work of the kingdom. Something that will outlast me. That makes a difference. And so I want to do it. And then how about, you got a convicted conscience? Has God convicted you about the way you're judgmental of others? You're trying to get a speck out of their eye and you got a two by four in yours? Is your conscience become defiled? Is it corrupted? Is it died? Does the light shine through clearly? Do you get it like you used to get it? 
Has it become seared where you're not moved anymore? You're going through the motions? Just let, let, let's hurry up and get it over with. Other than that line of people that are waiting to ask Jesus a question, there's one other request I have in heaven. I want the person to be next to me that every time they come to church, they want to know what time to get out. So they can look at me that first day and say, what time says over? <laughs> Never. <laughs> we're, we're here forever. Forever. So you're just going through the motions? Do you know I've been a pastor 42 years? Do you know I go to Sunday school every week? You know why I'm not in Sunday school now? I disciple five men. Been doing it for three years. Different men every year. But when I'm not, I've never missed Sunday school. I'm in Sunday school. When we were in four services, I couldn't go. When we got back into two in the morning, I'd go to Sunday. Why? Because I have to? No. I'm a learner. I want to be an example. I want to encourage. I want to still go out and witness with the Sunday school class. I want to give them their offerings. I mean, God's called me to be an influence in other people's lives. I care about how I influence other people's lives. And I don't want to get defiled. I'm trying to close. Let me just do this. Good night. Uh, Bob Harrington, even in his latter days, was a very good friend of mine. When he died, his daughter, which is married to Chuck Kelly, Rhonda Kelly, I'll be with him a couple days for, for lunch. She called me and said, you're the first preacher I've called to tell you daddy just died. She said, we went in his house, and she said, he's in dementia, but he had his album out, and your picture was on the top. I've got it in my phone of me and him. He came to our church when he got right with God and responded to the invitation. Asked, he said, I heard it. I signed your Bible when you were 20 years old after you got saved. Elon College, North Carolina. I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, I just got right with God. I've been living in sin for 20 years. Would you sign my Bible and write an encouraging word? Bob Harrington, when he first got saved, responded in every invitation. Every invitation. Sunday morning, he was down the aisle. Sunday night, down the aisle. It got to bothering some leaders. They got together went in sin and said, what in the world's going on? Why do you respond every service? He said, so, so I'm going to get like y'all. <laughs> you, you know what people say to me, to church people every week? I don't say how anybody stayed in their seat. Everybody should have been saved. Well, let me say something to you. They're lost without God, don't know him, don't have the Holy Spirit in them, don't know the Word of God. You know Jesus. God lives in you. Can I ask you a question? In Jesus' name, when is the last time you publicly responded to the invitation? No, you, you didn't hear what I said. When is the last time you publicly responded to an invitation? That God spoke. I mean, if you've been here, hundreds of services and God's not said a word to you to prove you to move. Let's stand for prayer.